design, yeah. Okay, so take the reporter speech as a, as a good example. Okay, so the direct report speech here. Oh, hello, Leslie. Still trying to buy something for nothing. So we can think about how that's designed. Um, the design is she quotes. She's doing quotation, direct report speech. She doesn't say, and she could have said something like, um, and he he came up to me and he accused me of trying to buy something for nothing. That would be non non quotation, non direct reported speech. Okay. But she desi she designs it as reported speech. Oh hello, he's still trying to buy something for nothing. Is speaking as if she was Mr. R. You know, he's telling his words, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you've got oh hello, well, uh, yeah, that, so these things often go at the beginning of direct reported speech. So they indicate, so part of the design is that you, you indicate your, it's no longer what I said, it's what Mr. R said. You go, oh hello, you know, or oh, hello Leslie, or well, turn initials like that, they indicate that it's the beginning of direct reported speech. So indirect is here, uh, Mark said he's not surprised that he behaved like that. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so, uh, so, in, so indirect is, um, so this is, uh, so Mark uh, said, uh, he's uh, about well, sorry, I'll, I'll do it in the proper, uh, said he's uh, not surprised. to do it as direct, okay, she could have said, Mark said, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. And we'll behave like that. Okay, so that's direct. Okay, so that's direct. Okay, Mark said, I'm not surprised we behave like that. Okay, so this is indirect. Mark says he's not. So you've got the different pronoun. Yeah. Okay, so this is so this is what makes it indirect. Okay, and this this would be the direct form. So we can think why did she design it as indirect, not direct? Okay, so why why design it in this way, not that way? Okay. So that's thinking about the design. So this is the direct because here Leslie is suggesting that this is exactly what Mark said. Okay, Mark said, "I'm not surprised he behaved like that." Okay, so the so the pronoun is from Mark's point of view. Okay, whereas here indirect the pronoun is from Leslie's point of view. Mark said he's not surprised that he behaved like that. So here she's not claiming to reproduce his words. It's, it's, okay. a, it's a way he speaks this way. Why, why does he speak? So this, so this would, so this is what she does, which is the indirect. Okay. Why, why? Well, that's what we're going to look at with the, the homework question. <laughs> why do indirect instead of direct? Okay. So there are lots of reasons. I will be talking about that this morning. Why you might design it as indirect as opposed to direct. Okay. Yeah, I will. I will talk about that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. This is so obviously that's direct. Oh hello, Leslie. Still trying to buy something for nothing. That's direct. Oh hello, Leslie. So he he said, Mr. R said, yeah, he said, yeah, direct, direct. Oh hello, Leslie. Still trying to buy something for nothing. Why? Why he? Why why direct? Why he? So why did she do it? Why did she use? Why did she design it like direct 
in direct, yeah, okay, in direct form. Um, because, okay, I'm going to talk more about this this morning, but um, so it's the climax of the story. And so what she's doing is she's, she, she's suggesting that this is exactly what he said. It's not her words, it's his words, it's Mr. R, R's words. <coughs> So by, when you say direct, direct quotation, direct speech, you, you do it as if it was Mr. R's word. This is what Mr. R said. Okay. Oh, hello, Leslie. Yeah, Mr. R said. Oh, hello, Leslie. Still trying to buy something for nothing? That's not Leslie's words. She says, this is not my words. This is Mr. R's words. This is what he said. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll begin with the. Uh, okay, we'll continue with the workshop that we did yesterday, and uh, there was a small, short uh, assignment for you all. So we'll begin with the uh, ten minutes uh, presentation. Uh, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly, but it should end uh, within ten minutes. So if you don't have to speak a lot, you could <laughs> complete it in five minutes. <laughs> okay. And uh, if you have a PowerPoint presentation, we could uh, copy that in the, the laptop and you could do that. If you don't have, you could just speak um, whatever is your interest in this. And of course, this will be there to help you out on the issues. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, boom, you are ready with that. Mung, Rohit, okay, uh, I'm not sure, um, is there anybody else in your group or not? Yogesh, are you in this group or are you a different group? Huh? People decide when I am because group. Group of big banana. Okay. I think Rohit and Mung, Rohit and Mung is. Rohit and Mung is one. Uh, uh, our university, we are with University Agra. So, uh, Mungu is doing with him fields from here, and Rohit is just a uh, fresher MA student. Because in the previous 
examples on direct speech, we have the, in the at the end, somewhere at the end or anything. But here, you just start, then that's and so we have to say it's more like, more direct. You say it's more okay. And the, for exercises, we have to say that the units, conversion units are longer, but the conversions are free. Like this two tracks pages is over. And I have a question. Like does the response in exercise six matter? For example, about the toenail. So Nancy says no, of course not. Like, no, of course not. So what I thought was her friend said I uh, her friend had taken her toenail uh, her toenail off. And so what I thought was this is like bags, it's hair, not in that. So like there is no This is like this is indirect, but does the response matter? Because if, if someone is responding, that it means like she has shifted from that uh, from the other person's speech to her own speech. But like he says, uh, my God, I never, I never suffered so. You know, so I don't there's a shift. Yeah, it's direct. That's mm. direct. That's what her mm. sister's friend said. Yeah. And in terms of design, like for example, in, I think the, I think for, for me, I think for here, in terms of for, so in terms of design, like, can we say that uh, an indirect reported speech is a direct reported speech between another direct reported speech? Yes, yeah, sometimes, yes, you can do that. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that's it. Yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. That was great. Is that one? Um, turn that on here. Yeah. So, oh. <laughs> um, okay, thank you very much. That was great. Some really nice points there. Some things that I wanted to see. That's fantastic. So, um, but probably I will give feedback at the end for all the presentations together. Is that okay? Uh, but that was very good. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next door to us, it's like um, around 100 kilometers. Be your neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> even lesser than that. Yeah, yeah even less than that. So, um, and both of them are doing PhD, right? Yeah. yeah. Both of them. Are. that I have discovered while going through this text today that I'll hand over to Andre. So, um, the first thing that I have noticed here in the indirect police speech is that uh, most of the time indirect, uh, first of all, let me tell you what is indirect police speech. In indirect police speech, we only have to reproduce the content uh, while we are not concerned with the form of the text. But in direct police speeches, we are also interested in the form of the language, okay, not only in the, in the content, okay. So for example, when somebody says that uh, I'm going to Agra to attend this workshop, okay. So it is, if somebody is saying that she said or he said, I'm going to Agra to attend this workshop, it's a direct reported speech, okay. Because we are uh, uh, focusing here on both, we are concerned with both the form as well as the content. And somebody said that she said or he said uh, that he was going to attend the workshop. Okay, that is the case of indirect reported speech. Okay, 
also we saw that uh, uh, the formulaic, uh, the nature of introductory speech is more like a formula. For example, I said, he said, okay, the formulaic nature is that there. And uh, while going for the purposes or the, uh, I mean, why we use indirect or uh, directory speech, I found out a couple of points here. The first thing, as uh, was obvious from yesterday's presentation as well, that uh, DRS, uh, directory speeches, are employed as a tool, as a strategy for objectivity and impartiality. It offers some kind of access to the listeners. As well as I think that it provides a certain kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, transparency to the uh, use of language in that, that uh, uh, the speaker is trying to display that he or she is not uh, taking sides. Okay, when, and, and this thing is more appreciated in the civilized world. For example, yesterday we had this, uh, a lot of talk of newspapers and news reporting. Okay. So in news reporting and newspapers, I believe that uh, uh, the audience, uh, they, they, they always demand some certain kind of transparency and objectivity. So I believe that uh, when new, in newspaper, uh, news, uh, news reporters or news writers, I believe that when they use uh, direct reporting speeches, what they are doing is that they are trying to, uh, trying to uh, tell a thing, okay, they are, they are try, trying to tell a thing and then leave it for the audience to uh, judge, okay, they are not passing their own judgments. This is, I believe, that direct police speech. So, in both the cases, direct police speeches or indirect police speech, I believe that they are serving as a kind of a tool or a strategy, okay, whereby you are trying to offer, the, uh, uh, trying to validate, trying to uh, legitimize certain kinds of discourses. So. And uh, in the end, I believe that they act as controls towards granularity, objectivity, validity, and legitimacy of discourses. And I believe that that can be used from the critical or discourse perspective. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Okay, and most of the points have already been covered by the front by what else I have discovered or uh, found, I'm going to discuss them. As far as the structure is uh, concerned, I feel that most of the indirect reported speech is located in the middle of the conversation as compared to or as contrast with the direct reported speech which was mostly present at the end of the climax of the conversation. Apart from that, one uh, another point that I noticed is uh, in indirect uh, reported speech there was no um, initial sounds that, that were occurring in the direct reported speech like O oh and A ah, and like that. They were not found in the indirect reported speech. And another thing that I noticed is uh, in indirect speech, uh, why the speaker is uh, switching to indirect reported speech as compared to direct reported speech, that uh, while the person is using direct reported speech for him, the information is not that important as the temperament or mood of the, of the quotation. That's why the speaker is uh, opting the direct reported speech, as we have seen in the previous conversations, that the person is not telling the listener to know the reason of his or her mood change or his behavioral change. That's why the speaker is opting for the direct reported speech. But it's not seen here because here the temperament is not that important as the information and simply the speaker is giving the information. That's why only the indirect speech can work. So there was no need of direct report speech. That's all I found. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yes, again, uh, very nice points there as well. Um, that's exactly the sort of thing, again, that I was uh, hoping that people would, would notice. Uh, it's a very nice point, both on the design and the position um, in both those presentations. That's fantastic. So, again, um, I'll do a, a summary. I think, uh, have we got one more presentation? Or is that? Yes. You wish? Ready? Feedback after, after this one. Uh, Hanuman, he is from uh, uh, English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad, and uh, he's doing his uh, PhD there. Yeah. Uh, he's doing his PhD there. Good morning, everybody. This is Hanuman from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. 
Yeah, well, like, um, I would like to start with the presentation and some of the like introductory things I would like to mention are that. Yeah, as, as, as we already, you know, yesterday found out that some of the things like direct reported speech is quite, you know, like, uh, it's like quite, quite, quite uncommon during the conversations as uh, like on otherwise, um, on the other hand, indirect speech is, you know, more, more common because the things like, you know, when we discuss uh, like uh, Chomsky's uh, definition of uh, uh, like, let's say competence, uh, especially linguistic competence, he says that there are certain uh, like finite, uh, there, there is a finite amount of, you know, linguistic structures every language has. But you know, uh, like uh, speakers usually combine these uh, finite structures. For example, we have limited number of sounds and limited number of words, and we use this limited number of, uh, like, let's say, units to combine, uh, like, them into sentences. And that's how we can go on making infinite number number of uh, like sentences and structures. And he also uh, he also he also says that these, you know, since uh, since we can make uh, uh, like this, I mean, since human beings are very creative, and they they don't uh, like they don't stick to all the like the forms they have already used in their like previous speech. So say, so with this help, with the help of this you know capacity, they can make a number of uh, new sentences, innovative and creative sentences, as well as they can understand a number of innovative and creative sentences. That's how he he kind of you know backs up his point and further uh, yeah as i said uh, direct uh, reported speech is quite uncommon because because there are certain certain things like memory uh, restrictions to human beings so uh, since we have like you know like uh, since there are certain uh, memory restrictions on human beings memory we cannot recall all the sentences or structures somebody has already said in the past so that's how we you we we like you know we try to represent those things I and mean, whatever somebody has said already in the past with the help of indirect reported speech. I will just give uh, two examples to compare uh, direct speech and indirect speech from the stories that are there in the handle. Yeah, on page number twelve we have a we have a direct reporter speech for uh, um, like the number twenty eight the dialogue number twenty eight where Leslie says uh, Leslie says and who we were looking around the stalls you no know, and and poking about and he came up to, come up to me and said oh hello Leslie still trying to buy something for nothing so it is a case of direct reporter speech and like uh, I will compare this with indirect for the speech that is uh, page number 14 where on um, the dialogue number seven uh, she 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 uh, she called me on the phone with uh, uh, with on the phone and asked me if I would help her if I would help her so that's the case of indirect for the speech where you know and another is there uh, number six in the next dialogue number four so Leslie says to Lynn, well, Lynn rang up this uh, fellow and said he was Duncan with his, is about midnight, with, with he, he about midnight. So these are the, these are the instances which, you know, like there are differences like uh, where uh, in the previous dialogue, in the direct reporter speech, the speaker is actually quoting what somebody already said in the, like, as they have exactly said. <coughs> and in the indirect reporter speech, we have uh, these examples where speaker is actually like just trying to represent what somebody said. So in his, in his or her, her own words. So that's the basic difference between indirect and direct reporter speech. Thank you. That's all. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Yogesh and Girijesh, uh, they are again from uh, Agra. Uh, 
योगेश इज डूइंग जनफिल एंड गिरिजेश इज इन थर्ड सेमेस्टर में Okay, so indirect is um, I said I want I wanted two to Gillam. Okay, that's the indirect. I wanted two to Gillam, and then I direct is so he said, uh, where the devil do you come from? I said uh, I have want to the okay. and again nineteen line. He said where where the devil do. Where the devil do you come from? Yeah, yes. That's what he said. So the ticket seller says, "Where the devil do you come from?" Where the devil? This is direct. Direct. Yeah. Okay. And uh, fourteen line. This is indirect. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. And so another uh, line. I think uh, page number fifteen and twelve line. Uh, the he said no. I have not seen. I am all evening. This is Dalek. Oh yeah, the uh, Lynn one. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So extract number four. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. That's right. Um, uh, uh, the um, and she he said no. I haven't seen them all evening. That's the direct. Yes. That's right. Whereas uh, Lynn rang up this fellow and said was Duncan with him. That's indirect.
thought it's, it's, it's not said, it's, it's something like she uh, yeah. saw and yeah. she, saw, she uh, saw them coming uh, down. Uh, so that, okay. uh, yes, sure, I know it's the transcription. <coughs> is. Yes, no, I, I, I mean, I heard. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, that's uh, that, that was, uh, one of those <coughs> things. Uh, okay, uh, not much. Uh, I, I don't think I have anything else, anything we need to add to that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Those points that you made, because you did cover many of the things that um, I wanted to say about those point, about those uh, examples, um, and you've picked out what I think are the major um, important aspects of those. So I'm very happy that you've managed to to do that. That's fantastic. Um, so maybe if I do just a quick summary, I think a lot of it obviously you have said, and I'm just agreeing, maybe putting it in slightly different ways, but um, I'm basically agreeing with what, what you said. Um, but let me just go through it fairly, fairly quickly. Okay, so as, as we've all noticed, which is I think the main point, is that... Uh, that you get the, I, the indirect reported speech first, and then in these examples, it's followed by direct reported speech. And often there's, um, it's just short, you know, maybe one TCU of indirect reported speech, but then many multiple TCUs of direct reported speech. So you get IRS, brief IRS, and then direct reported speech, which often you get a lot of direct reported speech. So that's a simple pattern, indirect before direct reported speech, um, and it leads up to the, in, uh, the direct reported speech. In some examples, I've given you a range of examples, in some you get indirect reported speech and then maybe not straight to the direct reported speech, but in others you get indirect reported speech and then straight away direct reported speech. In fact, you can even get it in the same turn, the same, um, sometimes the same TCU. So, so, for example, you get uh, the Barbara one, um, uh, yes, uh, number seven in, on, on page 15. Um, I just, so I just called Barbara and I told her, I said we'd, we'd had a problem. Okay, so that's indirect, we'd had a problem, um, past tense, we'd had a problem. And then, but then she changes to the, her name, but, uh, the vocative Barbara, and I don't know whether your father's going to be down here, so that's direct. So sometimes you can change mid TCU from indirect to direct reported speech. Okay, um, so I've given examples of sometimes it's, it's very quick change, sometimes, um, like in the first one, you get um, uh, she called me and uh, she called me on the phone to ask me if I'd help her. This is extract number three. But then you get some more details. You know when Bill, Bill, and, Bill and Gladys were here when I, and I said, then you get the direct report. Shh. I said, sure, I'll be down. So there's the direct report. So there, there's a little bit of a gap. Okay, so this is the basic pattern: indirect report speech followed by direct report speech. So why? Um, that's that's the structure. That's, we've described the sequence of the structure. Um, the sequence, that's the sequence. It's very clear cut, I think, and everyone, I think, pick, picked up on that. Um, so why? What, what about the design of indirect report speech? What makes it useful for this particular position? And as, as you picked up on uh, many, many of the things here, that it's not claiming to reproduce what was said in as much detail or ac as accurately as in as much granularity. Um, as you said, it's not so much about the um, form of what was said, it's just, it's a summary, it's, a, it's often a quick summary of what was said. And one of the things that, um, that we see about the indirect reported speech is, um, <laughs> I was under there, I'm hiding it, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, you know, it covers several pieces of information by useful story. So, you get things like, um, who, who is speaking, 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 who is spea
you see, you get, um, when, or how we came to speak. And then you get, uh, basically, uh, what, what are you talking about? Okay, so for example, um, in the next level three, you get, um, she called me on the phone, so who is she calling? Women and how is on the phone, and then task is a partner. So what is this about, um, about we're asking them to help? It's, it's a non-granular gloss, it's not, it's not granular. She called me on the phone, 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 and she said, oh, Emma, do you mind? I'm going to help, do you mind putting down really? And you can help me in this book. And that's just virtual granular, it's all details, much more lengthy. Uh, but she doesn't need that. Okay, and then with uh, before, so you get Lynn and Ray up this fellow, so that's a who, uh, we're talking to Ramadi for having empathy, and then we're talking to him for having So again, a brief loss of what Ramadi was, what Ramadi was about. In any case, yes, who went with Ramadi? Talking about a brief, non-banular, non-banular loss of what we're talking about. So we're talking about a conversation, a brief loss of what we're talking about. So this tells us, I think, why why are you designing this as a record of speech rather than a record of speech? It's not accuracy. It's not about being a record because we don't know. It's not accuracy. It's not accuracy. So we don't know. It's not precise. It's not the most. It's very unclear. It's very unclear. It's not accuracy. It's not accuracy. It's not accuracy. So why are you designing this? And well, what you do in this situation before you switch to record of speech is you need to be quick. You should be quick. It's a lot of information, but not just detailed information. You get record of speech. Because then you switch to record of speech, and that gives a lot of detail. It's very, very, very random. That's important. That's what conversations are. That's what you're talking about. This is kind of interesting. Okay. And so I think extract on it is very interesting because how is telling the story about altering these kids and getting the name wrong? So he needs to be aware, he needs to reproduce the way he can pronounce the station name, the channel name. Um, in fact, in fact, four ways, he has to do it, how do you say it on the left? Because it's a wrong pronunciation, so he has to reproduce that wrong pronunciation. Okay. So he has a reason to use the record of speech here. So he could say, um, so, um, so this is actually, uh, I think I'm actually going to show you, and I said, oh, we can have two together, please. Okay. He doesn't choose to use the record of speech, but it's Gillum, you know, and he reads it as a three-time, so he says, Gillum, then Gillum, and he looks at the first pronunciation. So I think it's interesting that even though there are good reasons for him to use the record of speech here, he doesn't, he still uses it in record, let's say I want to choose Gillum, not as I said, please don't actually say, well, I like to use Gillum, something like that, he doesn't do that. So you see, he ends up with something that is wrong, and the index, I said, I want to choose Gillum, and Gillum is done, I'm going to write back, because that's what's important in the story. Okay. So this is the evidence that, that it's useful to redirect the direct, sets the scene, it leads into, it's a transition from the background detailing to reporting what's said. It's that transition, okay, from
to um, often, you know, many TCUs of, D of D DRS. Okay, and um, so as we've said, the non-granularity non is quite important here because um, you don't need it to be very granular. You want a brief gloss before you switch to the very granular telling of what happened through the DRS, the, D the direct report of speech. Okay, yeah. If I would like to actually add something. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sometime back I was listening to one of the interviews of uh, the makers of movie. I don't remember his name, one of the makers of a movie like Five Stories and Man. He said that one of the arts of storytelling is that we need to involve the audience. Mm -hmm. Involvement is necessary. And I believe that the sequencing IRS and then DRS, I believe it, they are uh, serving as strategic tools. Uh, to make the audience or the listeners more involved in the discussion. Mm -hmm. So it's not like that we use DRS, okay? It is more granular and therefore we are reaching the climax too early, mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. yes. so I believe that IRS is a tool to involve. I mean, we are asking, we are offering a, a foothold for the listener to get more involved and then once he is more involved, then he will be probably uh, is more interested in the DRS. Mm -hmm. I believe yeah. it. Yeah. All that nice transition to, as you say, involvement with the uh, recipient um, and then more, more kind of involvement again in the DRS, but it forms that stepping stone, that transition, it gives the background information, tells them this is, this is what the conversation was about, now I'm going to play it through in great detail, very granular. Yeah. Um, and again, you've got the... the that you mentioned in your presentation as well, the, um, the slight shift in that the DRS is kind of very objective, uh, evidence, yeah. <laughs> uh, access, all that sort of thing. In the, in the indirect, you don't need that quite so much. It maybe begins the process, but um, you don't need it as much because it's not the form, it's, the, it's just the words. Even, just when, even when the speaker, mm -hmm. but if he uses if she, if she uses it, uh, that it is a display of her objectivity. I mean, I mean, yes. uh, the listener is uh, is bound to make believe in. Yes, right? exactly. We should say that it's not really objectivity. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's it's purporting. Yeah. Uh, in the paper I wrote on this, I don't know. yes, exactly, because we don't we don't remember, and and it's not. The remembering is not really important. The importance, as you say, is the creating the scene and involving the recipient and playing it out in detail. So, I mean, it's very unlikely that Mr. R would have, would have just come up to Leslie and said, oh, hello, Leslie's still trying to buy something for nothing. Or that Prince Philip would have said, huh, making another desert, I said. I mean, maybe, maybe something to, those were, you know, to that effect. Interestingly, Leslie wasn't even at the show. It was her husband telling her so it's not like she heard Prince Philip saying, huh, making another desert, I see. So um, we don't need to kind of assume that it's objective, but that's not what's important, I think. The important, as you say, is creating involvement, creating the climax of the story, or creating, creating this granular replaying or purporting to replay events. Okay, that's great. Any other comments or questions or thoughts? Okay, I haven't talked much about the form, but I'm hoping from the presentations, I, I think you know, we've um, most of you have a good idea of the difference in form. So that is, as you said, that um, IRS indirect reports which tend to be in the past tense. Uh, pronouns are from my point of view, not the reporter speaker's point of view. But as soon as you switch into direct report speech, present tense, um, pronouns are from the reporter speaker's point of view. Uh, and we get the things like well and oh and vocatives and all those sorts of things. So there are important differences in the form, and those lead to these differences uh, in the sequence and how they are used. Okay, uh, any other comments, questions? Um, thank you very much for the presentations. I really enjoyed those, and I'm very pleased um, to see the points that you, you made. It was great. Um, um, and I think that's worked very well. Um, so thank you for, for doing the homework and for putting, um, putting all the work in after what was a very long day yesterday. <laughs> um, so 
What I want to do the rest of today is uh, look at laughter, because that's something that my research has been on the last six years, maybe. And I've written about four or five articles and a book on laughter. Um, so I've just picked out a couple of examples of the different uses of laughter in interaction to illustrate those. Okay? So is that, is that okay? Yeah. Suppose if I want to um, mark uh, TCU and TRP in direct, uh, in, in, in direct speech, mm -hmm. so how can uh, we mark? Because here every, every statements are different to different. Yeah, it, an interesting thing which we haven't talked a lot about, but is um, direct, um, reported speech generally tends to be one single one TCU, system. yeah, and in, so often you get a single TCU of indirect reported speech, but then you often get several TCUs of direct reported speech. So you get maybe indirect reported speech, which is one TCU, then you get a TCU of direct reported speech, then a TCU, another TCU of direct reported speech, and so many, many um, examples of uh, direct reported speech, but just one, usually one TCU of indirect reported speech. So can, uh, so can I uh, map in with the TCU for extract the uh, indirect speech? You could, I mean, if you if you could go through and look at where this, you know, which is what are individual TCUs. Um, but that's very much just a starting point. We've kind of moved on from there to look at well, why why use indirect reported speech? Where do, where do we use it? What kind of pattern? What kind of sequence does it occur in? What kind of environment does it go up? So it's kind of a good thing to start off with, and as I say, it's, it's interesting to notice that um, indirect report speech tends to be one, one TCU, and then you get lots of TCUs, and you can think about why is that? Why do you get lots of TCUs of direct report speech and only one of indirect report speech? And that's link, links, I think, to what we've said about it forming this transition from the background detailing of the story to the very granular replaying of what was said. Okay. Any other comments or questions? No, okay. So, um, how are we doing for time? Uh, so, we've got to 1.30, is that right? Uh, we've got lunch, lunch at 1.30 today, yeah? Okay, great. All right, so what I'll do is say is move on to laughter, and what I'd like to do is give a brief introduction to laughter, so talk to you a bit about laughter based on my research. And then I've got some examples that we can look at to see, again, if we can find sort of patterns to laughter, just as we've done with reported speech. Okay, is that, is that okay? Okay, great. Um, okay, so laughter, obviously, it's an interesting um, phenomenon because it's non-lexical but it's prevalent, it's everywhere, um, it's universal, it's a very important part of interaction but it's um, tricky, it's difficult to analyse because it's not part of the lexical system, it's not part of the linguistic code and yet it's a very important part of interaction. So interaction is not just about the lexical items, uh, it's about other things as well including laughter. Now, also I think laughter is interesting because it tends to be a bit misunderstood. People tend to assume that laughter is very closely related with humour. Okay, so I say something funny, you laugh. Okay, but conversation analysis has shown us that much, maybe most I would say most laughter in interaction is not about humour. Okay, so there is a big difference between laughter and humour. They are not the same thing at all. Of course, sometimes they are closely related. You get a joke, and then you get laughter. Okay, so sometimes they are very closely related, but they are not the same thing. So we get laughter in many places, and I will show you some today where there's nothing funny going on. Nothing funny at all. Okay. Another thing about laughter is, um, obviously, 
it's possible to try and account for laughter in, from a psychological point of view. You can say, oh, well, she laughed because she was nervous, for example, or she laughed because she found it funny, or she laughed because it was relief. So it's possible to do sort of psychological explanations of why we laugh. But it's also important to look at sequential understandings of why we laugh. And it's possible to say a lot about it. We don't just laugh because we're nervous or because we're, we find something funny. We laugh at very, very specific points in interaction. Okay, so la laughter, like all interaction, is not haphazard. It doesn't just occur anywhere. It occurs at very, very specific points in talk. So it's not just a simple reaction, a simple result of some psychological state at all. Although maybe occasionally it can be, but in interaction generally it is not. It's very well positioned, it's doing certain things. Okay, so, um, so I've given you a little bit of uh, information about laughter. Um, so as I said, we can look at laughter for where it occurs in interaction. So um, I have a very large collection of examples of laughter, hundreds and hundreds of examples of, of laughter in interaction. Um, lots of telephone talks, some informal, some informal, lots of um, uh, telephone talk, but also face-to-face -face interaction as well. And one of the things we notice is that laughter tends to occur in two sequential positions. So I've given you examples on the handout on page, um, page 17. So very often laughter occurs at the end of a turn. So in extract number one here, um, so Leslie's talking about uh, having received a letter from her son's French pen friend telling them that his mother has moved out, leaving him with his father. And so Leslie says, and uh, oh, it's such a sad letter, really. He writes, I ha oh, I have to buy my own steaks and cook them. And then we see at the end there's a <laughs> bit of laughter. And then Gwen laughs as well. So after the reported speech, again, it's a more direct reported speech, oh, I have to buy my own steaks and cook them. And then we get laughter. Interestingly, the, the reason I got in interested in laughter, first of all, was from the reported speech because very often direct reported speech is followed by laughter. There is a very close relationship between reported speech, particularly direct reported speech, and laughter. And that's how I first got interested in laughter. Okay, so um, so the, very commonly we get a turn and then laughter at the end of the turn. Sometimes you get a bit of laughter within the speech as well. Sometimes you just get the speech and then laughter at the end. The other very common position of laughter is as a response. Okay, so in the next example, so Dana's reporting a conversation with her college lecturer about her choice of university. Again, a more, more direct report, uh, and Dana says, you don't want to go there, it's boring. I said I want to be bored. Um, and there's, um, she smiles as she says that. The pound sign in line two, the pound sign means she's smiling. You can hear her smiling. She says, I want to be bored. Um, but then Leslie laughs in response. Okay, so that um, in line three, the he 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 he, that's uh, Leslie laughing. It's very difficult to report laughter. <laughs> Um, so luckily I've got the sound files for most of it because I can't uh, play it. <laughs> um, so one of the things that we can notice straight away about laughter is obviously it doesn't have meaning on its own. It's not, it's not meaningful on its own. And the way we make sense of laughter is by seeing what it relates to. You know, we laugh at something. We don't just laugh for the sake of it. We laugh at something. So there's a close relationship between laughter and some, something else, usually some other talk, some preceding talk. So I'll put there, you'll notice that laughter links to some prior talk, i.e. when we laugh, we laugh at something. 
the target of the laughter is known as the laughable. So in NCA, we call whatever the laughter seems to relate to, we call a laughable. Okay. And the reason we, we use that is um, we're not saying it's a joke or because often it isn't funny. You know, there's nothing funny about it. So, so laughable is a nice neutral term. It's just whatever got the laughter, whatever was the target of the laughter. Okay. We call it a laughable. Yeah. Uh, like you're laughing, are you laughable or is it laughable? Um, okay, if we were talking about him and you said something about him and I laughed, then the laughable would be what you said. What I think. Yes, what you said. Okay, so it's the it's the the linguistic elements that the laughter targets. Okay. Not, Not sort of I mean, obviously, occasionally we might laugh at something else. Say, we might be, uh, well, I might be talking and I'll knock over that board, <laughs> knock you over the board. Um, so there, obviously, it's not a linguistic thing that we're laughing at, but mostly in interaction, obviously, and the, the examples that we are going to look at are all about um, laughing at something that someone has said. Okay? So, like, you laugh at me tripping. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. But hopefully not. Um, but yeah, so so what we're talking about is where you get some talk and that is targeted by the laughter. And so that talk is the laughable. Okay. So, for example, in um, in extract one, um, the quotation, "Oh, I have to buy my own steaks and cook them." That's the laughable. Okay. And in extract two, uh, Dan is saying, "You don't want to go there. It's boring." And I said, "I want to be bored." That's the laughable. Okay. But was he not cook? Okay. So, like, if he says that, "No, I cook." I think we're laughing at him, it's not the... Yes, I mean it doesn't mean to say that it's really intentional. It doesn't have to be intentional. So, um, we could laugh at him for saying something that he means very seriously, but we're laughing at it for some reason. So, it doesn't have to be intentional. So, oh, I think it's not about the word, I think it's about the person. Um, or, or an action, maybe. Um, there's a very nice article by Philip Glenn where he distinguishes between laughing at and laughing with. So you might want to have a read of that. But um, um, yeah, we, we are concerned with kind of the action. All right. Okay, so, um, so I've put here a little bit about laughter and laughable, so hopefully that will, will help. Uh, laughter in interaction is occasioned, it has a target or referent. This could be prior talk, or it, could, it may be prior laughter, or a combination. Where laughter has prior talk as the target, the utterance is referred to as the laughable. So according to Glenn, and Philip Glenn in uh, 2003 wrote a very nice book about this. Placement of a laugh relevant, re sorry, relative to its laughable displays precisely what the referent or laughable is, typically via placement concurrent with or immediately following the object. So in other words, you get some talk and then you get laughter and usually the laughter is about that talk, okay, linked to that talk usually. Obviously there are exceptions, but usually you get some talk, some action, in linguistic action, and then you get the laughter and the two link together. Okay. Or you can get, as I said there, you can get laughter and then more laughter, and that second laughter is laughing at the first laughter. Okay. So, um, I put, um, according to Glenn, the relationship between laughs and their reference defies consistent labelling, in part because the term laughable glosses over an analytically problematic notion. Virtually any utterance or action could draw laughter under the right or wrong circumstances. Okay, so this is just noticing that 
laughable is a very neutral term because, you know, we can laugh at many different things um, and it doesn't have to be funny. Um, so there might be lots of different reasons for laughing. It's often very difficult to, to say what the reason is, why people are laughing. It's very, very difficult when you look at laughter and talk. Um, so laughable just allows us to look at that relationship without saying, well, he's laughing because it's a joke, for example. Okay, okay so, um, so why do we laugh? If it's not that we're laughing because it's funny, why do we laugh? Um, now, there's been, ever since the beginning of CA, there's been some very nice influential work done on laughter and um, several very nice articles on laughter by Gail Jefferson. And in, she wrote a paper in 1979 on laughter and she noticed that laughter can invite laughter. So I laugh and then you laugh. And my laughter invites you to laugh. Okay, so I'll give an example there. So Ellen, again, again reported speech. It's amazing how much <laughs> these things go together. Um, Ellen said, he said, well, I am cheap, he said, about the big things. He says, but not about the little things. And then she laughs, ha, 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 ha. And Bill goes, ha, ha, ha. So what Jefferson says in her 1979 paper is that um, Ellen's laughter invites Bill to laugh. Okay, yeah. Wait, was he laughing because... Was he laughing because she laughed? Or was, was he laughing at what she said? Yes, that's a very good point, yes. Now, there is a tricky, this idea about laughter inviting laughter. Um, because... There are many, many occasions, most laughter in interaction is solo laughter. It's not reciprocated. So it cannot be the case that all laughter invites laughter. And many people get this wrong. It, even now, we still read, people assume that if there's laughter, it's inviting laughter. And I get to review lots and lots of articles uh, sent to me from journals where people say, um, look, there's this laughter, but, but the other person doesn't laugh, so they're turning down an invitation. And I say no, because maybe not all laughter is an invitation. So it was, a, it was an important point that Jefferson made, um, and it's going to be useful to us in a minute, but one thing I do want to say is that not all laughter invites laughter. Okay, In certain situations laughter invites laughter um, and I've added I've written a paper where I argue that various things work together to invite the laughter so I would say it's both it's the reported speech and the laughter Jefferson would say the laughter I would say both Okay, so in my, in my paper on this, uh, on the nature of laughables, I say, if you have things like, say, a reporter speech and you have laughter and maybe you have intonations shift, like animated tone, things like that, they all kind of work together to invite laughter. Okay, so, but it's a useful idea that sometimes, sometimes, laughter invites laughter. Okay, but we have to be a bit careful about that. Because Jefferson herself did work on laughter in troubles tellings, and that laughter does not invite laughter. Okay, so she knew, she didn't spell it out maybe, but she knew that laughter doesn't always invite laughter. Okay, um, so why do we laugh? Well, um, drawing from some of the other research that's been done on this, one of the things, um, one of the reasons we laugh is um, to modify or mitigate or soften what we say. Um, so in, I've given you extract number five, uh, sorry, number four, and I don't know if I've got the sound file, I might have the sound file to this. I'll have a quick look. Kind of soften, mitigate, 
uh, actions. So um, what we have here in extract number four is um, Vera and Jenny are talking about um, Vera's grandchildren. Okay. Um, so this is Vera's grandchildren, uh, but they're both they're assessing the grandchildren. So um, Vera says, you know, uh, Jenny says, yeah, well, I think he's a bright little boy. Um, and Vera says, I do. And Jenny continues, little James, uh, Paul, yes. Paul, mm -hmm. Paul, yes, yes, yes. And then Jenny says, yes, uh, James is a little, uh, James is a little devil. And then she laughs. So James is a little devil. <laughs> uh, quite a little laughter. And then Vera says, James is a little bugger, isn't he? I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not into laughter. So, can, do we have a unified theory of laughter? Or, I mean, because what I see here is that we are probably more interested in laughter, analysis of laughter from the CA, CA perspective. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we might have other perspectives of laughter. I mean, yes. different theoretical um, considerations of laughter. For example, as in jokes. I mean, uh, here we are more interested in the laughter from the participants' points of view, but the hate joking, for example, and happy jokes, we are more interested in, uh, I mean, uh, uh, their ability to evoke certain kind of laughter from the part of the audience. Yeah. So I was just wondering, do we have a unified theory of laughter which can encompass uh, the different uh, hues and colors of uh, laughter? I'm not sure about it. Yeah, okay, yeah, so is there a unified theory of laughter? And you're right that there is a great body of work in humour theory. So there's been a lot of work done on why we laugh in terms of um, when discourse is funny, when discourse is humorous. So there are different accounts of that. So for example, um, it could be accounted for as um, a relief, a relief from tension, feeling superior, the superiority theory. The third theory, which are, or set of theories, which is, I think, the most useful, is incongruity. So there's um, the argument that, that things are funny, things are humorous, because they have a certain kind of incongruity. And, and I think that's true. I think I teach you a course on humor, and we look at lots of jokes, and lots of stand-up comedy, and lots of uh, funny programs. And incongruity is very important. A certain kinds of incongruity is crucial to humour. So that's as, as close as we get, I think, to a sort of what I would say is a kind of um, a global theory on humour. But people who work on humour don't tend to understand laughter fully. So they see laughter as a response to humour. Obviously, that's what they're interested in. And they tend to see it in a very simplistic way. So you get humour, you get laughter as a response. And, it's a, and Philip Glenn argues that they tend to see it as a sort of cause and effect. Okay, a stimulus response. Laughter is a stimulus response to laugh, uh, to humour. Okay, so, um, so no, we don't really have a full theory yet of why we laugh. And I think the reason we don't is because um, it's, we laugh for so many different reasons and in so many different places, so it's very complicated. So, for example, um, I, uh, I, there's a project going on in, um, about trying to um, make computers laugh uh, and recognise laughter. Okay, and I have been um, a, a, a bit of a consultant on this project because they want to know, you know well, when do, why do we laugh and um, you know, what does it mean? And I have to say, well, it can mean lots of different things, and we laugh for lots of different reasons. That's not to say it's haphazard. There are patterns to it, and I've started to recognise and, and unpick some of these patterns. But it is very complicated. Yeah. So uh, what I was really the pragmatics of it. I mean, of course, when we talk about jokes, we are more interested in the pragmatics and the ambiguous nature of language. I mean, it evokes a certain kind of laughter because we have so many laughter shows on, on air. And uh, the, the pragmatic aspect is important. Uh, and apart from that, and this is because um, my own research here is the, um, the political aspect of things. So I believe that uh, 
there is a politics of all of all also that is involved in the real lives and laptop. For example, in one of the research uh, researches I was going through and there I uh, and they say that for example at workplaces, I mean it is the superiors that they can crack jokes and laugh about but not the other way around. So I believe that uh, the political uh, uh, angle, uh, I mean, I, I, I believe uh, it will be, I mean, from my perspective, I believe that. There are so, there might be so many perspectives, yes. of course. Yes. So I, I believe that to have a unified theory, I believe that it's really difficult to, really difficult. Yes, you're right, yeah. 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 So as you say, there's some very nice research on workplace humor. And uh, as you say, that. Um, the kind of direction of the laughter, if you like, or the direction of the humour. Um, so, but yes, you're right, it's so complex that it's very difficult to have a unified theory, I think. And, we, and we're not in that situation yet, I don't think. <laughs> Which is lucky, so there's more work to be done. <laughs> often. So, in this example, Jenny is criticising Vera's grandchild. She's saying, yeah, James is a little devil. So this is, this is not her grandchild, this is Vera's grandchild. So she's criticizing, she, she's looked after them for a little while, and she says, you know, James is a little devil. Now, you know, obviously that can be a bit tricky, criticizing your friend's grandchild, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not easy. Um, but she laughs, okay, so she, she says, James is a little devil, and then she laughs. So, um, the um, uh, Hepburn um, argues that this is mitigating, it's softening the action. There's a tricky action, a delicate action here. Criticizing someone else's grandchild is difficult, is tricky. And the laughter helps to deal with that trickiness. Okay. So that's one um, use of laughter that's been identified in the literature. Um, and then another use related, very closely related to this, is something that I've looked at, which is um, Laughter um, can make, can indicate that you're not being serious, non-seriousness. So, um, so in extract number five, um, so Leslie says, right, so I'll see you there. So she's worried that they're going to a dance with Eleanor and she's worried that the dance is going to be too difficult. She's not going to be able to do the difficult the dancers. So in line uh, three, she says, I hope it won't be too difficult. And Ele Eleanor says, no. Uh, and then again, no. And then Leslie says, go on. <laughs> okay, so she laughs. And then Eleanor laughs. So I shall just play this one for you. The laughable there was my mistake. <laughs> we laugh at mistakes. Yes, that's an expert. So. Right, so we'll see you there. That will be too difficult. No, no, go on. Do you want to get to the next time? No, we're not. No, we very often get it wrong. Yeah, just uh, go back and play that again. Okay, so what we have here is difficult. Eleanor disagrees, you know, says, no, no, it won't be too difficult. Leslie says, go on. So Leslie's kind of disagreeing with her. Um, so, you know, go on is kind of disagreeing with, uh, with Leslie. It's doubting the truth, uh, uh, sorry, disagreeing with Eleanor. It's doubting 
the truth of what Ellen has said. It's questioning what she's just said. Um, but what uh, the laughter does, perhaps it's, it changes it from um, a real kind of disagreement, a real questioning of what um, Eleanor has just said, to something non-serious. It's not, doesn't have the same sequential implications. It's not meant, it's not to be taken as a disagreement, it's to be taken as something else. And we see that Eleanor does do that. Because instead of saying, no, it's true, I'm, you know, I'm telling you the truth, she, she just laughs as well. Okay? So laughter can be very useful. It seems that one of the very important um, uses of laughter often is this kind of um, dealing with tricky actions, making softening, for, for want of a better word, tricky actions, or dealing with delicate situations. We get lots of laughter associated with problems. So it's, it's very much um, against what we might expect. You know, you might expect humour plus laughter. That's what's common. In fact, when we look at interaction, you get difficult, tricky situations and then laugh, laughter. Okay, did you have a question? I think that's, I mean, that is a very good parallel in the fact that we that laughter or smiling is so important that we've had to import it into email and texts uh, because actions are not always easy to read on their own. So if I say something like um, uh, you didn't turn up today, you know, that can sound quite accusing, a complaint. But if I say, you didn't turn up today, ha ha ha, or smiley face, then it's not quite so uh, accusing, it's not quite so complaining. Although I have written a paper where I say it's still maybe a bit of both. <laughs> you know, it's not, um, uh, it's hedging our bets, perhaps, but yes. It depends to what extent. Exactly, yeah, and the wider context, yeah, very much so, yeah, yes. But yes, is that how I think about lol? Do you have lol? Yeah. Laugh out loud, yeah, in, in emails or texts. Um, and as I say, I think that's really good evidence about how important laughter and smiling is that we actually have had to put them into a written form of communication um, because we need them. Because you say otherwise it can be a bit confusing as to how did, how did she mean that? Did, was, she, was she telling me off or was she just making a joke? A joke? Okay. Uh, okay, so thank you. Nice point there. So what we've learned so far is that laughter isn't just a result of humour. It can be doing other things. And it can, in certain circumstances, laughter can invite laughter. Um, and it's meaningful. It's not just a response to humour or nervousness or whatever. So what I'd like to do is to illustrate one of the uses of laughter that I've looked at, one of the patterns underlying laughter that I've looked at. And I think it's, for me, it's kind of one of the nicest, clearest patterns. So what I'd like to do is have a look um, at some extracts that illustrate, I think, this very nice use of laughter. Okay, and what we're going to do is start with the first one, because the first one, I think, sets up a puzzle. And the puzzle is at line, um, at line 53, Hal doesn't laugh. He says, but um, basically, you know, we came back on Friday night and spent the night with friends. He doesn't laugh. If you look just before that, Leslie has laughed. She said, that's right, and then she's laughed quite a lot. Now, I think, um, as I said, not, laughter isn't always an invitation, but this is one position where I think last, Leslie's laughter could have invited Hal to laugh, I, I believe. Okay? This could be an invitation to laugh. But Hal decides not to take it. He doesn't take it. Okay? He talks instead. And this, so this is a bit of a puzzle. Why does Hal not laugh here? So what I'd like to do is just play this extract, keep this puzzle in mind, 
and then looking at the next few extracts, hopefully we'll come up with an answer to that puzzle. Okay, so the first one is just there to set up this puzzle. Why doesn't Hal laugh at line um, 53, 54? And then we'll see, I think, when we look at extracts 2, 3, and 4, why he doesn't laugh, okay? Okay, so I'm going to play extract uh, number one first. So, um, what's happening here is that um, <coughs> Howell has been to visit a part of England called Kent. And Kent is where Leslie comes from. So Leslie knows a lot about Kent. She grew up there. And Hal's been there for a, a, a holiday trip. So at the beginning, when Leslie says, good, where else did you go? They're talking about Kent. She wants to know where else he visited in Kent on his trip. And they talk about um, uh, various places that Hal went to. And they start talking also um, about other people who go to Kent and relations, their relations that live in Kent. Okay, so let me play it through anyway. It's a little bit confusing because I've missed out, because it's quite long. Um, you'll see after line 19, there's several uh, turns of the lines of the transcript missing because we, we don't need all that information. Um, so um, there's a bit that we'll hear, but it's not. Not, not in the transcript, okay? It's just extra information that is not so crucial to what we're interested in. So let me play this through. Yeah. 
and Joe to hold some salad. Well, he fed the girl, as you know. Yeah. But Joe felt it was very wrong one up the chip. <laughs> to a pattern that we can see in the other extracts and there are reasons why this one doesn't go along with the pattern. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the other extracts. Um, so again, this is how, but this is with Skip next time. And um, so it's towards the end of the call and Skip says, um, or, um, has the call been recorded? He's wondering if the call that he just made has been recorded. Um, and, um, and Skip says, oh, I'm sure it, she, she would have told you if it had been recorded. Okay. So this was how talking to Leslie just before. Um, okay, so I'll just play that one. And I think I've messed up. I think I've lost my uh, drop box.
is to give you a chance to look at those examples. So again, we're looking for a pattern, we're looking at the laughter, why do they laugh? Um, sometimes you get several occasions of laughter and you can think about those, but um, um, they're a particular kind of, um, there's a pattern which hopefully you will see. So what I've said is, um, I think there's a slight deviation to the pattern in extract number one. Uh, so I think there's, there's a slight deviation to pattern extract one, and we can kind of solve that puzzle, why doesn't Hal uh, laugh at lines 53, by looking at the other. Okay, so if you look at those, you will hopefully see a pattern quite nice and clearly, and then we can think back to, okay, well, can we use that to explain why Hal turns down that laugh invitation at line 53 in the first extract. Okay, so let's spend some time, uh, give you some time to look at those, and then I will uh, get, do a summary that it may be after lunch, okay? All right, is that okay? Any questions? Okay. Do you think there's a role gender? A gender, yeah. It, do, do I think gender comes into it? Yeah, invitation. Uh -huh. For example, uh, This one, mm -hmm. there's no love, but here, they, for every laughter, there's a question laughter. Yes. I, in CA, um, there are problems in, in terms of explaining things as attributes related to the speaker. So, saying, you know, X does Y because she's a female, or, or X does Y because he's a male. Um, because it could be lots of reasons. It could be, I don't know whether it's because X is older than Y, or X is more middle class than Y, or more educated than Y. There are lots of possible reasons why people might do things. Um, but what we tend to find looking at talk is that there are patterns to the talk, regardless. You don't need to kind of use um, facets of the speaker's identity to explain them. If, if identity comes into it at all, usually in conversation analysis, it's about identity as a storyteller or as identity as a, um, obviously in certain institutional talk, then the identity can be quite significant because you, you are, the sax will put you are doing being a doctor or you're doing being an interviewer, but it has to be kind of manif manifest in the talk. And um, so there are people who use conscious analysis to investigate gender, but they do that in terms of looking at occasions where gender is manifestly oriented to in the talk. Okay. So as a sociolinguist, yes, you might explain it as being to do with gender, and certainly you could use kind of detailed analysis that CA provides to look at gender, but then you, it wouldn't be a sort of pure CA kind of study. So as I say, have a look at why, well, what the pattern is, and um, and then maybe look at sort of the extract two onwards first, and then perhaps look, go back to extract one to see if we can explain why that laugh invitation is turned down by how. Okay, is that right? Any other questions or comments? No. Okay, so I'll give you a bit of time to, to look at that.
This is the sort of mitigating, modifying laughter, softening laughter. This is a different, slightly different use, and that's the slightly different use of laughter. So you say this is Okay, I'm saying that sometimes laughter can be sort of softening or do you know the term mitigating? Not really, okay. So here, yeah, this is very tricky because Jenny said, um, yeah, James is a little devil and James is Vera's grandchild. Okay, so, Jenny, so Jenny basically is kind of criticising Vera's grandchild, which obviously is a tricky thing to do. Um, but she laughs at the end. So this is saying, um, this is softening it. And I'm not saying, you know, oh, your, your grandchild's horrible. I'm saying, oh, James is a little devil, isn't he? No, no, no. It's different. Okay? It's, it's softening. And same, similar, slightly similar sort of thing here where there's a saying, go off, which is kind of disagreeing. So, so you know, I hope it works too difficult. She said, no, no, no. And Les is kind of saying, well, go on. You know, is that, are you telling the truth? Um, but then she laughs. Uh -huh. And then, so Ellen laughs back. So again, it's that softening. It's, it's not, it's not a criticism, it's not a disagreement. It's a, it's non-serious. And about the uh, other total us. Maybe she laughs her to mitigate the way. And then she didn't laugh her. She didn't laugh. So maybe this is the last thing that was. And yes, she was really uncomfortable. Maybe she was really uncomfortable. Can you say? Yeah, maybe, maybe she continued it. As, that's right. And maybe she carries on. I mean, so she carries on. And that's quite a lot of laughter, isn't it? But, um, I mean, she doesn't agree with her. She does enjoy it with the laughter. But as I say, this is a different situation. So not all laughter is an invitation to laugh. But can, can, you, can you say that she was really uncomfortable? Sorry, say again. Uh, can you say like she was feeling uncomfortable because she criticized the gel and now she's feeling uncomfortable? Well, that? who knows? Who knows? I mean, it softens. It softens it. Vera does go along with it, so she doesn't really have James's little bugbear. Yeah, in fact, she upgrades it because I think a bugbear is worse than the devil. Oh, so she so doesn't really. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, bugbear yeah, is worse than the devil. Yeah, that's quite a bit. Uh, almost like swearing. No, I thought it was like she's saying to, uh, since you say soft and I thought it's a little bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's the other way. Oh. So, so Jenny, Vera does go along with it. She's not, uh, oh, yeah, no, not She's not upset by this criticism. She does go along with it.
for lunch now uh, let's will discuss this after the break and uh, we we'll, would we'll have the lunch at the same thing that we had yesterday so when our break we come back at
someone laughs and the other person joins in with the laughter. And there are various things I think we can say about the sequence um, and also about the design of the turns within the sequence as well. So one of the things that you might have noticed that, um, so starting with the broader sequence and then we'll focus in and go into some of the details. Um, but in each case you have shared laughter. And what happens, you might have noticed that in each case, this is so extract two, three, and four, the shared laughter comes at topic termination. Okay, so it comes around topic termination or it brings about topic termination. Okay, so in each case you have topic termination, shared laughter, and then we have, in each case, a pre-closing. We have a move to close. Okay, so let's go through that in the example. So we have in uh, extract two, we have um, Skip says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure she would have told you if it had been recorded. Then they laugh, and then um, both of them say, anyway, anyway, and then they move to closing. Okay, then I'll see you Friday. Thank you for calling. Hal says, thank you for calling. Okay, so they move to closing, closing the call. So you get topic termination. I'm sure she would have told you if it had been recorded. Shared laughter, move to closing. In number three, it's the same. You get, um, again, it's at the end, very end of the call. I hope you don't mind your conversation being recorded. This telephone is bugged. And then you get, uh, down, it's down for prosperity, no state secrets. So you get that topic finished off, then you get shared laughter, and then, okay, then, well, let me know if you don't get the ballot paper in time. Yes, okay. So that's, um, that was the reason for call, as I, as I mentioned to you. So they go back to the reason for call, and then they close down the conversation. And then same sort of thing in four. So as I said, they, they were starting to close it with lovely thanks for ringing. And then there's a little bit of a reopening, a new little topic. Do I speak with my, do I speak with my new teeth in? Uh, yes, you're coming up loud and clear. And then share laughter and then closing. Okay, love, right, bye bye. Okay, so that's the pattern. We get topic termination with the shared laughter and then we get moving to closing. Okay, so that's the overall sequence. And we can say various things about why. So looking at the design of these terms. And a lot of you noticed that there are certain things about some of the, some of the topic closings um, share certain characteristics. So things like, yes, you're coming over loud and clear. Uh, no state secrets, down for posterity, no state secrets. Um, these, these are the laughables, these are the things that get laughter. And we can say certain things about their design, can't we? All those are um, idiomatic expressions. Well, they're down for posterity, no state secrets, in three, and then, yes, you're coming over loud and clear, in four. So they're idiomatic expressions. And in, in other work, I've shown that idiomatic expressions often occur at topic termination, and they're a very useful device for closing topics. But I think we can say something more about these because not only are they idiomatic expressions, but they're, they're kind of overdone, aren't they? They're overdramatic. So to say, um, yes, you're coming over loud and clear um, where, because she's got new, teeth, new false teeth, she's talking all right with her new false teeth, it's, it's sort of overstated, it's dramatic. You know, coming over loud and clear, you know, it's the sort of thing you would say on, um, I don't know, a microphone or um, radio uh, or a transmitter, you know, you'd say, yes, coming on loud and clear. So it's not quite sort of um, appropriate for that situation. So it's a bit incongruous, we could say. Um, and it's kind of overly dramatic for that sort of situation. Same thing again in, uh, in extract three, down for posterity, no state secrets, 
you know, and, and those link nicely, and we were talking about the bug before, it links nicely above that to the, um, I, don't, uh, I hope you don't mind, your telephone conversation has been recorded, this telephone is bugged. You know, again, bugged is dramatic, it's, um, it's not quite appropriate for the situation in a serious way. You know, you don't bug people's phone calls, you record people's phone calls, you spies bug each other. Governments bug each other, bug people, you know. So it's not quite appropriate. And the same thought, so that's carried on with down for posterity, you know, down for history. Again, it's like posterity is a very grand, formal term. Um, no state secrets. That's, that's similar sort of ideas being bugged. You know, it's about national importance. So in both cases, they're doing these sort of overdramatic kind of idiomatic expressions. So that's, that's the laughable. Okay, they're not quite serious. So it, it, we might say it's joking. Uh, it's quite incongruous. Um, and then you get the laughter, and then you get the topic change. So, um, so we can say various things about the topic termination itself. The shared laughter, what could we say about that? Well, one of the things is obviously why it might be useful here is it, um, it doesn't carry on uh, it doesn't continue the topic in terms of, it doesn't add anything, it doesn't add new information, does it? To laugh is not to, is not to continue talking about the topic, it's not to add anything new. <clears throat> um, Jefferson says that um, some laughter, and this will be useful later as well, is um, disengaged. It's starting to sort of get disengage from from the last topic, from the details of the topic. It's kind of taking a step back. So shared laughter is very good, um, is a good way of bringing topics to a close. Because um, I laugh to show, well maybe to suggest that I've not, you know, immediately got anything more to add. You can laugh too, you laugh back to sort of say yes, you know, we we're happy to, to, to do this now. Um, we, can, we can close. So it can be a useful way of closing down topics. Interestingly, as I say, in each of these cases, and this was the same for many of the examples I looked at, had a bigger collection. Um, not only does it close the topic, but it proceeds pre-closing. So not only do they close the topic, they don't usually introduce a new topic, they, they close the call. Okay, so not only is it very useful in topic closure, but it's actually very useful in conversation closure. And I guess it's, it's uh, you know, shared laughter in particular perhaps creates rapport, affiliation. Um, it's a nice kind of friendly, happy note to finish the conversation. Okay, so laughter can be very highly affiliative, it can be. We'll say it's not always the case, but it can be very affiliated. Um, so, we have a nice pattern here, and we, and we have some reasons why the laughter might be um, useful in that pattern, in that series of actions. So, going back to extract one then, okay, I think this could have gone a similar way, you know, so they kind of, ha Leslie's making a joke, you know, you should have consulted me first. Um, she laughs. Um, he says, um, that's right. Uh, oh, no, sorry. He, he says, um, yes, I should have done. She says, she, uh, and then, um, sorry, he continues, because that would have, you, because you would have known where all the relations are. She says, that's right, and laughs again. Hal could have laughed there, and then they could have gone into closing. But they don't. Instead, Hal turns down that invitation to laughter by overlapping the laughter with butt fun and he goes back to the topic. And in fact, if we look at a little bit earlier, if we look at line 50, um, no, 45, we see that actually Hal is desperate to get in some more information here. You know, with this but, but, but we went. Hal hasn't finished talking, but he's been sidetracked by Leslie. Leslie's gone off at a tangent talking about all the relations. Hal's still got more to say. And in fact, actually, even before that, we get, I think at line 18, um, it might have been there that he was trying to continue with Noah. 
So right at the beginning of this extract, Leslie has said, where else did you go? And he's doing this list. You know, well, we walked the North Downs one way, one day, um, but we didn't have very long there because we stopped with friends at Brighton, husband at Brighton first. So he's, he's, he's not finished. So he's explaining why they didn't have long, but he hasn't finished talking about what they did. So, uh, so she kind of comes in and says, oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you went because very few people to go, go to Kent. So she's kind of taken it off on another track. So he's trying to get it back on track, back to his itinerary, no, uh, in line 18. But then it doesn't work, and they end up talking about relations. And then he tries to get it back on track again at line 45. With but 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 we went again. That doesn't work. Headed off by Leslie. So if he'd laughed, if he'd if he'd done share laughter at line 53, I think he would have been in great danger of losing the topic there. They would have done share laughter, and that would have been it. His chances gone. Okay. So I think by turning down that invitation to laugh, what he's doing is he's he's bringing it back into the topic. He's saying I'm not happy along with closing this topic. I've actually got more to say. Okay, so it shows that these patterns, we can identify these patterns, but of course there are exceptions to these patterns, because people don't always want to go along with the pattern, they want to do other things. Okay. Right, so that was one of the patterns I wanted to show you, is the shared laughter at topic termination. Um, and interestingly, as I say, when I made my collection, um, and I have many hundreds of examples. And I guess because of Jefferson's paper about laughter being an invitation, I was I was thinking that a lot more laughter would be shared. So I went through and I I noted where all the laughter occurred, and whether it was shared or not. And very little of it was shared. Most of it was solo laughter. And very often the that where laughter was shared was at topic termination. Okay, so there are particular environments, I think, where laughter is treated as an invitation and, uh, and laughing along um, can help bring the topic to a close. Okay, so that's one pattern that I wanted to show you, and then there's one more pattern I'd like to, to show you before we finish. Okay. And this is rather different, because what I wanted to do is show you two types of laughter that are very different. So that's kind of nice clear-cut laughter, shared laughter, associated perhaps with humour, Things like, you know, no state secrets, um, you're coming over loud and clear. You can see those, those are kind of funny, incongruous. So I want to show you kind of the opposite of that, which is laughter, very different laughter, different sounding laughter, in a very different environment, okay, as a, as a sort of contrast to that. I've looked at other environments, other kinds of laughter, but these are two that I picked because I think they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. Okay, so, moving on to the next section on page 22. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at is laughter in complaints. So it's here, so a very different kind of environment. Now what I might do to start off with, I'm just going to see if I, I did bring a video clip. I haven't brought the um, transcript because I wasn't sure whether it was going to work or not. Um, but I'd like to, I'm going to see if I can play the video clip, and if not, it doesn't matter, we can just look at the audio on this bit. But I'll see if it works, because it'll be a nice break, something a bit different. Example of the phenomenon I want to show you, although the ones from the audio um, clips that we'll look at in a minute are slightly, slightly different, but it's the same basic pattern. Now, this is a program, um, it's a, a, ser a series of programs that were recorded in the UK a few years ago. And what they, what they did is basically they went into someone's house and they just put cameras everywhere and they recorded them solidly for three months. Okay, so it was just their ordinary daily life 
recorded all the time and then edited into these programs. So it's not scripted, it's completely natural. It's edited but not scripted. You will hear voiceover, they did put a voiceover on it, so you'll hear that as well. Um, the father talking um, to make the voiceover. But basically what we've got here is we've got um, an example of family interaction, family interacting together, and, um, and it's non-scripted, spontaneous talk, okay? So what I want to see, you'll see the laughter, uh, and I think this is a very nice, as I say, it's a very nice clear case of what I'm going to talk about. Um, although it's kind of perhaps starker than some of the ones we're going to look at in a minute. Okay. When I became a father, I swore I'd do things differently to my dad. He never did the cooking, he did the discipline. You didn't really get a drink to get out of the table. You said you were trying to ask you. Mom, I'll eat you if we didn't eat you. But some days I find myself sounding just like him. Thanks for your help, guys. Thanks, Dad. I really appreciate you, you could have helped me get it out of the oven, put it on the table. Well, did you ask him? Well, nobody actually had that. Well, did help me, didn't they? Sorry. You end up some bloody waitress service is going to put it on the table, and it pisses me off. That's the attitude, isn't it? No when I became a father, I swore I'd do things differently to my dad. He never did the cooking, he did the discipline. Did you really want to get drinks to get out of the table? But some days I find myself sounding just like him. Thanks for your help, guys. Thanks, Dad. Really appreciate it. Help with what? Well, you could have helped me get it out of the oven, put it on the table. Well, did you ask him? Well, nobody actually had that. Well, did help me, didn't they? I open my mouth and hear his voice coming out. It gets to the point where you look just wandering like some bloody waitress service is going to put it on the table, and it pisses me off. That's the attitude, isn't it? Nobody can bother to empty the dishwasher. Nobody bothered to clear up half themselves. Nobody bothered to put the food on a table. Nobody bothered to do a whole load of things. It gets on my nerves. You can't be bothered to wipe my shirts. You can't be bothered to clear up half yourself. You can't be bothered to go to bed on time. I'm shouting because that radiator is 27 degrees and there's no need for it. Luckily, the family know me well. The easy option would be just to stuff some shit in the oven and eat that. <laughs> Especially my wife, Jane. So 
just any immediate reactions to? It's hard to say, isn't it? Like some people nodding, some people shaking their heads. That you know, I mean, it's tricky with, with things like this.
from there I feel like they are prepared to laugh, they are trying to laugh, and they're just waiting for someone to start the laughter. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they start laughing, even the father like is changing. Mm -hmm. And when the man starts smiling, like for a man, when they're serious and when they break, it's difficult to come back. They get really so I don't think like uh, uh, this is like all play, like this is not the first time, right? Sure. Mm, yes. It happens again and again. So maybe he has said that, uh, maybe he, he told them that he won't do it again, maybe because he said he, he wants to learn from his dad. So maybe he landed once and then he apologized, and then maybe he said he would do it, yeah. and he started again, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, as you say, I mean, obviously we don't know, we can only speculate, but, um, but yes, you kind of get the feeling this is a bit of a common kind of, why are you laughing at and get even more angry? Um, so yes, you kind of know that, but uh, but we don't know that. We, we can only speculate because we don't, without more evidence, we can't be sure. Okay, so um, <clears throat> so I wanted to show you that, because so I think it's a very stark illustration of this pattern that I'm going to show you in some um, similar kinds of environments, similar things happening, but um, different in terms of these are, these are phone calls now, these aren't face-to-face -face interaction, these are phone calls, and these are just two-party phone calls. So for that reason, it's a little bit different. Obviously, laughter is something, I guess, that's very much affected by how many people are present, because, of course, laughter is very unusual in, in interaction, because you can join in with laughter. Um, you know, we, we learned yesterday that we talk one at a time. You know, there's a, a rule in our society that you try, you talk one at a time. But laughter you can do together. So it's different, it's very special, very important. Um, so of course it's, it's affected by how many people are present. And, and we saw a very nice illustration there of uh, lots of people joining in with the laughter. Um, so these are slightly different in that respect, because they're only two person. Um, and we'll see that the laughter is rather different here. But this basic pattern, think is the same. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at, so I'm going to start with extract one on page 22. <coughs> now this is um, Leslie talking to her mother, and they're talking about Leslie's mother-in-law. Leslie's mother-in-law comes to visit every Sunday night. So um, when her mum says at line three, has she gone home yet? Um, her mum is referring to the mother-in-law. Okay, so she's asking, has the mother-in-law gone home yet? Okay, and they start to talk about the mother-in-law, and then, then she says, um, the mother uh, at line 12 says, we're, tell her we're having a memorial service for Louisa. Okay, so someone that the mother-in-law knows has died, and they're having a memorial service for her. So, so her mum says, have you told, have, have you told her? I think, I think that's, have you told her we're having a memorial service for Louisa? And Leslie says, no, I won't, because we'll have a big lamentation then. In other words, her mother-in-law will make a big fuss because she, maybe she, um, maybe she can't get, go to it because it's some distance away. Uh, yes, uh, uh, sorry, she, she's, uh, that she wasn't there. And then her mum says something like, oh dear, honestly, how dare she expect to be there? And, her, and Leslie says, I know, yes. And that's in smile voice. You can hear her smiling as she says that. And then you get, she was so wicked to Louisa, and then you get, at line 27, a little bit of laughter, equivocal laughter. And then her mum says, all those years ago, yes, okay, love. Okay, so let me play that for you. Um, Leslie's sister-in-law and um, so this is Les Leslie's sister-in-law obviously her mum's daughter-in-law um, and they're talking about um, 
presents for Leslie's son's birthday. And I've put there at the top, Mum has told Leslie that her daughter-in-law informed her that she would probably send money for Leslie's son's birthday. Okay, so the mum says, your sister-in-law is going to send money for Gordon's birthday. Okay, and so then they, when they get um, a complaint about, <laughs> about her uh, generosity or lack of. in terms of the pattern, in terms of the ongoing talk, where does it occur? What's the similarities? What's it doing? Why, you know, why are they laughing, laughing in, that, in that way? Okay, what happens beforehand, what happens afterwards? Okay, and thinking about the, the environment that it, how it, it comes into. Okay, is that all right? If, obviously, if you need to hear it, just give us a chat and I'll play it again. Okay, so we take maybe just 10 minutes or so on that and then I'll do 10, 15 minutes and I'll do the summary and then okay, and that's, that's it. Okay. Let's look at those. So any any just thoughts at the moment on what that laughter is doing or where it's occurring? What can we, any anything that struck you about that the laughter or the or the wider sequence in which it occurs? Can we see any patterns emerging? The laughter evolves, I believe, also in cases of uh, uh, when probably you expect. For example, here in case that her mom, and it's obvious that her mom just, uh, didn't like probably her grandmother. It's obvious, yeah, and uh, this is obvious because of the fact that she has uh, used the God of Grace, she has said in that degree, okay, in that in degree marks. And I believe that uh, in this case, laughter evoked probably because uh, uh, due to the fact that her mother 
and use these decreased uh, volume in line 9. And this provides a kind of a hint that her mom probably is uh, uh, irritated by her mother-in-law and that too might be the cause of uh, uh, laughter that we see less in uh, line 11. And uh, similarly in line 25 when she used the word wicked and with an emphasis of we. So uh, laughter probably caused the use of the word wicked and that's the display again of her mother uh, irritation with her mother-in-law. I believe this is yes. Yes. That's right, that's very much so. Yes, one of the things I wanted to say was that, yes, <laughs> where her mum says between Leslie and her mother, and usually her mother is, is not, as, <laughs> not as negative as that, it's all very polite and very nice. So when she says, you know, she's so wicked to Louisa, this is about the strongest thing she says in the whole course, in all, in all the conversations I've got. So yes, I think you're right to notice that this is, this is quite a, uh, an outstandingly um, negative assessment of the mother-in-law and uh, you can tell <laughs> that she, she doesn't like the mother-in-law. Um, so yes, um, and, and also as you said beforehand, uh, even before we get to that point, you've got, um, uh, you've got, um, you know, how dare she expect to be there, you know, oh, but we've got, oh dear, honestly, and then how dare she expect to be there, that's strong as well, from, from her mom, coming from her mom, again, um, you know, how dare she expect to be there, she was so wicked to, to Louisa. And so what's Leslie doing in response to this very strong, uh, these very strong assessments to her mum, what, what's Leslie doing? Do you think, what, what's Leslie's point of view, if you, to, that's speculating. But if we speculate on Leslie's point of view, what's her what's her point of view? Yeah, Leslie's point of view is that she's not pleased. I think she agrees with uh, uh, her mother, and she's probably she's probably been sympathetic to a certain extent. To a certain extent, yes. To she. Yes, and that's probably similar in the uh, other extract also where uh, there is uh, this uh, nasty remarks about not being able to afford Christmas presents. So that laughter and this probably the uh, agreement and something like that. Yes, that it looks uh, one common pattern for both the laughters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so as you say, there's agreement there. But I think we're right to use the expression to a certain extent because it's only, it is only to a certain extent, isn't it? Leslie's not fully going along with this and her mum isn't fully going along with it in the second one. So, yes, um, so we get her mum saying in, in, in number one, and we say, you know, how dare she expect to be there? And yes, okay, she says, I know yes. So yes, she's agreeing. There is smile voice in that turn. So perhaps already we're seeing Leslie agreeing, but at the same time, just backing off a little bit. Yeah, just, as you say, sort of, you know, calm it down. <laughs> calm it down, don't get carried away. Uh, very subtly, with the agreement, I know, yes, but, but smile voice at the same time. It's not saying, um, again, we can think about what she could have said. She could have said, you know, Yes, how dare she expect to be there? Exactly. You know, she could have gone along with it, couldn't she? Upgraded it and said, yeah, this is terrible. She doesn't. Yeah, that's the way it was in the first extract that we looked yesterday. So, uh, there we had the full present uh, agreement. I think Leslie and Joyce about this uh, Mr. R. Yes. yes. There he Yes, exactly. Nice point. Yes, we don't get the sort of agreement that Joyce did in, in that extract. And you, you're quite right there. You get Joyce being really nicely supported by saying, yes, you know, isn't he terrible? Isn't he awful? And you don't get that here. So we already start to see that although Leslie is agreeing that line 24, she's starting to kind of, you know, disaffiliate a little bit or disalign a little bit. But her mum carries on. She doesn't take the hint. She says she was so wicked to Louisa. So she upgrades the complaint. She, she increases the complaint. So her mum is still 
continuing the complaint, she it, she um, she upgrades it. As I say, she she actually um, comes up with a stronger assessment. I think she was so wicked to the reason. And then we get a pause, half a second pause, not not you know a short pause, and then. Hmm. So again, what's do you think Leslie's going along with this? She's so wicked to Louisa? No, not fully, is she? No, because again, she could have she could have said, you know, yes, she she was terrible, wasn't she? She was dreadful. She doesn't. She does. Hmm. So what we see here is laughter being used. It's in the in the last set. Sorry. Uh, this laughter isn't a response. Uh when you do not want to be upfront of somebody, and you want to mitigate something, you don't want to agree with something, but at the same time, you don't want to be upfront, you don't want to be direct with someone, and I believe that this is what Leslie is done. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Leslie's in a happy about, you know, her mum talking so negatively about the mother-in-law, who, who knows. However, but what we can see is that Leslie doesn't go along with this complaint. But she doesn't, the other thing she doesn't do is she doesn't say, oh, well, actually, you know, um, well, you know, she, okay, but, but she, did, she did help her out on occasion, you know, so she's not disagreeing either. She's not fully going on with the complaint, but she's not disagreeing either. Yes, equivocal, that's right, yes. So it wouldn't be appropriate if Le if Leslie'd gone, ha 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 ha, you know that's different again, isn't it? You know, but this little this little mm, is disengaged. It's equivocal, and it's entirely fitted to that situation. It's very nicely fitted. So again, one of the things that we're seeing is it's disengaged, just like we saw with the other laughter, more so. Thing, which more so here. Now, in the other, in the, with the shared laughter of topic termination, I said it was very affiliative. I think so. Laughter can be very affiliative. It can create rapport, but it can also be be totally disaffiliative. If you're laughing at someone, you're disaffiliating. If they say something serious and you're going, <laughs> you know, you can you can be very disaffiliative. What we see here, I think, is somewhere in the middle. So I think it's kind of, um, you know, if we have disaffiliative laughter here and we have very highly affiliative laughter here, this is, this is somewhere in the middle of affiliation. Okay, so laughter can, can do all those things. It can be very affiliative, it can be totally disaffiliative, and it can be somewhere in the middle. So what she's doing here, I think, is exactly what, what you said, is, is kind of being nice, going along with it a little bit, saying, okay, enough. Um, you know, I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm not, but I'm not fully supporting you. Okay, you know, cool it down, enough. Um, so it kind of maintains social solidarity. It maintains some affiliation, but it's not going along with it. It's not anywhere near as affiliative as it could be. And afterwards, we get topic termination, don't we, in both cases. So we get, um, so to describe the pattern, what we're seeing is um, complaint, um, then we get upgrade. Oh, uh, sorry, and, and actually what we do here, what we see here is um, B is not going along with the complaint, not fully going along with it. Not fully going on with the complaint, but A continues and actually upgrades it or um, exaggerates it or whatever we want to say. And then we get the laughter, minimal disengaged laughter, and then we get topic. Uh, we get topic termination or um, pre closing. So again, like in the other situation, it does have, it seems to have this sort of topic terminal quality to it. But it's very different here, obviously, because we're not getting a nice big shared laughter. 
as we are here, we're getting these little minimal laughters, but it still seems to be topic termination relevant. So let's have a look at that in terms of the next example, um, ext extract number two, sorry. Yeah, it may be topic termination. Okay, it's, it's not, it's not shared, so some of the person who is laughing, the person who is laughing, she is there. Yes, that's right, yes, so, so exactly, so it doesn't, it's not smooth, it's not quite smooth here, so uh, you're right, so, so actually her mum perhaps tries to continue a little bit with all those years ago. But Leslie still doesn't go along with it. She just says yes. There's a little pause, and then okay, love. So Leslie does the topic to Leslie. again a pre-closing, closing down the call. Um, so let's track through the second one. Um, so we've got um, a long complaint by Leslie here. So we, and, and that's this is um, this occurs over several turns. You've got um, you know um, so her mum's kind of saying, you know, don't, don't complain about her, things are very expensive these days. But Leslie says, you know, in line 19, uh, yes, but she expects it the other way. She expects it the other way. You wouldn't mind. And she gets it the other way. But then we get nasty remarks about not being able to afford Christmas presents. So again, you get some disaffiliation before this from her mum. Um, you get this, you know, um, well, things are very expensive these days. And then when Leslie says you wouldn't mind, we get kind of, hmm. she's doing these little minimal responses that are not fully kind of affiliating. And then um, again, so Leslie continuing the complaint in the face of not getting the support, full, full support from her mum, upgrading it, but we get nasty remarks. Again, this is strong, this is strong for Leslie as well, nasty remarks about not being able to afford Christmas presents. And so again, we get then the laughter, aha, ah, aha, aha. Um, again, disengaged, minimal, equivocal. And this time, her mum sort of continues by doing several termination relevant turns. Did it, did it? Bit dismissive, isn't it? It's not, you know, it's not taking this complaint entirely seriously, did it, did it? Uh, hmm, never mind. So her mum is bringing it to a close. She, again, she's showing, you know, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not saying, well, actually, I think, you know, she's, she's right, you know. Um, she's just going, yeah, okay, enough, enough. Let's finish that. Let's talk about something else. And she does do that with them. Oh, now, what was I going to say? So then she introduces a new topic. So in, in both cases, it's the person who did the little equivocal laughter also then does a new topic or, or pre-closing. So yes, what we're seeing here is a very different use of laughter, so the shared laughter, although they both both happen to be occurring in topic termination, but this is a different environment. They're both complaints, they're both strong complaints. They're complaints about people the other one knows, their family members. And what we're seeing is that the other person isn't going along with the complaint, and yet that person who's complaining upgrades the complaint, continues it, upgrades it, and yet, and so, um, then you get this little equivocal laughter, and then you get topic termination. And I think there's a similar pattern in the video, I don't know if you, if you agree. It's, as I said, it's rather different because obviously you've got more people there, it's much more laughed, lots of laughter there. But again, you get him upgrading the complaint more and more, escalating the complaint. You know, first of all, it's about food. You're not, you didn't help me get the dinner out. And then it's, um, you know, you, you, you don't sleep. You don't iron my clothes. Um, that radiator is 27 degrees. I could stuff some shit in the oven. You know, so it escalates, it escalates it. The family are not going along with it. They clearly show that they're not going along with it. They're not affiliating with it. But neither are they explicitly saying, hang on a minute. Um, so it reaches a sort of climax and then they start laughing and it changes the topic. Okay, so that was the last pattern I wanted to show you involving laughter. So as I say, two very different patterns. I've looked at other uses of laughter. Um, and if I'd had more time, I was going to, to briefly show you some kind of call centre interaction where you get people saying, you know, oh, the computers go very slow to get today and you get laughter. Um, but um, we won't go into that now. I, I've written a paper on it, so if any of you want to read about that, let me know and I'll send you a, a copy 
the paper, and I've written on various things, so again, email me and I can send you copies of the paper, papers. Um, so just to summarise, what I hope to have shown you is, I suppose, the importance of, if you're going to study interaction, um, from my point of view, as a conversation analyst, I think it's important to look at the sequence, to look at how these patterns work out over the terms, over sequences of talk, to look at how sequences are constructed, to look at the design of the terms within those sequences, to think about what they're doing, how they're contributing to the overall action sequence. So not necessarily thinking about it in terms of you know what do, what are speakers trying to do, what are they trying to do by laughing, but kind of looking at how it can how it might deal with a complaint that they don't want to go along with, that sort of thing. Trying to do in that those terms. So as I say, for me, I've tried to show that sequence is important, and sometimes quite big chunks. You need to look at big chunks, like in the um, the one about the. Um, going to Kent, about how going to Kent. When we tracked back, we saw that actually for you know several times he tries to get in there and say, but um, but um, but um, we went to, and so you need to kind of go back quite a long way to, to fully see what's going on. So sometimes you have to look at quite large sequences, um, and then so within those you can track through, look at the designs of turns, look at what happens after the turns you're interested in as well, because we obviously what's been very important today is looking at. Not only the laugh to say, but what happens afterwards as well. Um, and so, hopefully, I've shown the value of looking at, in detail at talk from this point of view. In it, and, and I've tried to show some of the things that it's shown us. Um, that it's shown us about turn taking, shown us about turn construction, shown us about adjacency pairs, and, and then my research has shown us about reported speech, both direct reported speech and indirect reported speech, and uh, laughter. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Oh, I'm nearly bang on. Oh, it was four o'clock, actually. It's quite a little bit early, actually, isn't it? I didn't realise. I thought we were coming up to five o'clock. Um, yeah, really, really good idea about how to work on this and how to do. So what um, uh, I, we were thinking about is, okay, uh, about more specifically about the aggression and how do we say if we have our data and aggression, uh, I mean any kind of data, we're looking for uh, whether, uh, uh, I mean one big issue is how do we know uh, whether it's aggressive or not. Yes. Shouting is probably one of the things, but that's not the only thing. I mean, it's probably similar to what you did for laughter, that most of the times it's not humor. That's creating laughter most of the times. It's not shooting. That's creating uh, that could be called aggressive. So, um, I mean, it's a very general question. But in general, how how do we go about say analyzing the interaction and looking for uh, something which is uh, not as uh, evident as uh, laughter itself? Maybe uh, one way would be, of course, to look for the patterns of where people mm -hmm. shout and where they don't and what yes. is it leads yeah. to that would be one way. But um, yes. I think beyond that. <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry, let me sit down. Okay, um, yeah, so it's a very good question. It's, it's a very tricky question. Obviously, one of the things that I've hoped to do today is to, is to perhaps give you some tools that could be useful in looking for aggression. CA would never necessarily talk about aggression because that, again, that's getting into the psychological kinds of um, issues. So we, we, it would talk about maybe conflict or, or you know, disagree, disagreements, or you know, try and um, break it down into various sorts of different different patterns. Good question. Um, I think you know what I would certainly do if I was if I was going to look at that it, it would be try and pick out sequences, as you say, where you've got things that you, you kind of. From a lay point of view, you do associate with aggression, like shouting, and maybe swearing, things like that, and basically look at those sequences. Now, that's certainly not going to cover everything, because as you say, that there'll be, you know, what we might loosely call aggression.
that is very actually very measured, very quiet, very you know that could be that might be the most aggressive at all. Might be to say you know no you know that could be, it could be you know we don't know. So it's not going to cover everything. So. But that's what I would probably do, is look for these patterns as, and look for that escalation. And I suppose one of the reasons why I chose that, those examples to look at last is because perhaps that's one of the times I've got nearest, as I say, it's, I'm, I'm not, unlike Jim and Daniel, I'm not an expert on conflict, as they would call it. Um, that's one of the points, perhaps, where I've got nearest. In CA, we talk about affiliation and disaffiliation, uh, which I think is, is useful in terms, to, so it might be worth having a look at those. Um, but, um, what was I saying, I was going somewhere with that, I forgot. Uh, yeah, so I would look at the sequence, look, look at how it develops, look at how, obviously from a CA perspective, um, you need to look at the recipient's response, so that's a good way, because obviously identifying aggression or whatever you call it in interaction is very tricky, because you, and you want to avoid in, inputting or inflecting your kind of analyst perspective. So how do you do that? How do you look for it objectively? And one of the ways is to look at how it's treated. Okay, so look at the response. So again, that's why sequence is important because you need to look at the, the response and see how the, um, how the recipient treats it. I think it's very interesting that in that clip, she said, the wife says, don't shout. Now he's not really shouting, I don't think. I don't think his volume gets particularly loud. He's not, he's not actually bellowing at all. Maybe what she's reacting to is that he's swearing a bit, he's complaining, you know, strongly complaining. So, so maybe what, when she says, you know, don't shout, what she's actually meaning, and, and again, taking this from the big picture, sorry, because, because we can't read minds, <laughs> um, that she's reacting to the, to the fact that he's kind of getting He's swearing a little bit, he's getting upset, you know. Um, because he's, he, as I say, he's, his volume doesn't actually grow up that much. So she's, she's orienting to it as something which she calls shouting. And I guess we associate, as you just said, shouting with aggression. Um, so what we have there perhaps is a lay illustration by participants of, of you know, what she takes it to be. But she says shouting, but actually perhaps it's more about you know, orienting to this as, 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 you know, aggressive or whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's what I would say. Uh, you need to look at the sequence. You need to look at the, the orientation of the participants and see if it's possible to come up with some, um, uh, some patterns or some things that are associated and I don't think you'd ever cover all of them. I don't think you could cover it all up, but I think what you might do is see that, yes, when you get shouting, when you get swearing, when you get very dispreferred, you know, disagreeing terms, that that's what lay people orient to as aggression or conflict or arguments or, you know, whatever, whatever we want to call it. Does that answer the question at all? I, as I say, I've got a slightly, obviously my perspective is rather different from Daniel's and Jim's because, because you know, for the CA, we're all about the participant's yeah. perspective and not about coding, you can't code. In CA, you can't really code. You can spot sequences, spot patterns, but you can't code, as it were. So it's, it is a rather different kind of perspective. Although, like a pure CA perspective is, is slightly different, but it can feed into that because it can, it can help you look at these sequences at all, and that's what I've hoped to have given you, is kind of perhaps some basic ideas that are useful in analysing interaction, because I don't think you can spot aggression um, in talk without looking at the details of the interaction. And doing perhaps beginning with a very qualitative analysis, in the first place at least, going through these sequences, looking at how they escalate, looking at how people orient to terms, uh, looking at the design of the terms. That's that's where I would begin. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. You might, as I say, you might sort of, if you can, in the first place, come up with something that is associated with aggression, um, then, then you can 
do the detailed analysis after as well. I would say that they, they can keep feeding into each other, to be honest. Yeah.
Sorry, sorry. Video is easier. Video is easier. Uh -huh. Yes, because you, obviously you've got the, Maybe, yeah. you know, the visual multimodality there. Yeah. I feel like video is easier to understand. Yeah, okay, well, it's good, good to know for future reference. Um, but do you feel basically that you were able to, to, to get um, a feeling of, of what was going on in the, in the telephone calls as well? Yeah. Sorry. Were the, uh, I used a couple of American examples, like the one about Barbara and Barbara. that one. Yeah, were they were they slightly harder, or were they just as easy as the English ones? No, they weren't easy. <laughs> they weren't easy. No, I mean that's an interesting point. Whether there's a cultural difference there that the Ameri American might be less easy to understand than the English ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I find them less easy to understand. Yeah, but okay, <laughs> yeah. it depends when we watch movies. Yeah. Harry Potter is more difficult to understand yes. the from Game of Thrones. Yeah. Uh, yes. They're British. Um, because, of course, they are, uh, most of the people are used to American movies more yeah. than British. Yes. Yeah. 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 But yes, in this, yeah, yeah. the telephonic conversations are the most difficult for me. Yes, when American movies first came to Britain back in the, I don't know what it would be, the thirties maybe, they were subtitled because English, English people couldn't understand them. <laughs> but now we don't need subtitles. In fact, now we speak American. <laughs> um, okay, so that's a, it's interesting to know, obviously, because then, um, uh, because it's tricky for, for me, because obviously I, I, I can understand very well, so I try to give you information to help you understand, but it's hard to know how, how easy or how difficult it is. But I mean, certainly I got from your comments, I got the feeling that you, you, know, you were getting a lot from them and understanding them well enough to, to come up with some very nice uh, observations. So, so clearly, you know, it was, there was enough, enough mutual understanding there. Uh, any other comments? Uh, How difficult was it for you to understand what we did? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's very, it's very good. <laughs> um, no, I hope I've always understood you well, in, well enough. But, uh, but yes, no, it's been, uh, been a pleasure. <laughs> Is there no but? Sorry. No. Is there no but? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It was, it was good, but no, no there's no but. <laughs> no, it's been a pleasure. And I'm really glad that, uh, as I say, I think a lot of the um, observations you've made have been spot on, you know, exactly what I was looking for. So I'm very happy, like with the presentations this morning, I was very happy because um, I wasn't sure, you know, how easy it is to understand it. It's a lot to cover in two days. It's, as you say, it's a big introduction because, you know, you, you've, although you may have read about CA, so it's different doing it. It's very different. Um, and so obviously I wasn't sure how much you know, uh, you managed to take from yesterday. So it was really nice to hear those presentations and know that, that you, 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 know, you were spot on the kinds of things that I wanted and the kinds of things that I was thinking about. And some very nice, very, very nice comments and very nice observations. <coughs> Vitesh asked me to recommend with, with the abstract um, reading. Um, so as, as I say, I can if you if you're interested in my research, I can send you copies of my research. Um, please email me, and I can um, I have a lot of them on PDF, so I can attach them to an email. Um, but also um, in the the abstract that Vitesh asked for, I um, suggested an introduction to conversation analysis. 
which is by Jack Signal. Did you get this suggestion, Jack Signal's book? No, I'll write it down. I think the, in the booklet we have missed the, we have missed the full abstract and it's there on the web page. Well, actually, no, sorry. You know, if there's something particular that you're interested in that you want to reference us on, I can, I can supply those. So just drop me an email and ask. And maybe you could also. Uh... I enjoyed it very much, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And, you know, taken some interesting things. Whether whether you ever going to use CA or not. That's fine. I just hope that maybe it's given a new perspective, or it'll help you understand. Perhaps if you read CA articles in the future, it might give you a better understanding of where the author is, is coming from. After all the good speech, I think uh, related to all this, um, she the person. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely let me know and I, as I say, I'll recommend whatever I can do to help. Yeah.